Are y'all having fun? <laughs> Hasn't this been so great? It's so pretty in there, and the food was delicious, and now we're going to get to have some worship time together and to hear Benita, and so it's going to be an awesome morning. So if y'all would love to stand with me, you don't have to, but if you want to stand, we're going to sing together, and I love a room full of ladies singing. You know, it's just so, so, you know, sing with us, sing out loud, clap, whatever you want to, but we're just here to worship, so let's do that. Here we go.
there's so much we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked and one by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off as slaves but we know that you are god yours is the victory no, there is more to come than we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we step into the valley unafraid. Yeah. And we call out to travel, come alive.
so good. You are so good to us all the time. And you've walked with us through good and through bad, and you've never left us. And Father, we just pray this morning that we can focus our eyes on you, that we can listen to the words that Benita speaks today, and that you have laid on her heart, Father, and that you will just move in this place. Your spirit is welcome here, and we love you, Lord. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I think it's working. <laughs> well, good morning. Oh, isn't it good to be here? Yeah. Um, thank you to the ladies that organized it and the worship team, and thank you so much to the men who served us. Um, I'm Benita, for those who don't know me. Um, I'm so thankful to be here. Um, and if you're like me, you're probably... Really thankful to just be sitting down for a little bit. Um, I live most of my life like this lady that they're hopefully going to put on the screen here in a second. Yeah, can y'all see that? I'm a single mom of four kids, so I live most of my life exhausted and crazy uh, like this lady claims to be. Um, so I'm thankful to be here with grown-ups uh, and to talk about stuff that I feel like can really benefit all of us. We're going to be in Ezekiel today, which is um, one of the Old Testament prophets. And um, if y'all want to be turning there, we're going to be in chapter 37. Um, but we're going to start kind of with an overview of Old Testament history so that when we get to the text, we can be on the same page going into it. So I'm going to spin and look at this. Oh, it's not back there. Okay. Can y'all put that up? There we go. Right, so, in the beginning, God. We know that's how the Bible starts. That's Genesis 1-1. We don't know the answers to the questions my kids want to ask, like where did God come from or who made God, but we know that in the beginning, God. And um, God, this beautiful, incredible creator God that was all-powerful, just spoke everything into existence. Um, created the heavens and the earth, created light, created the sun, moon, and stars, uh, made the sun to spin on its axis to give us day and night. Made the sun to revolve around, excuse me, the moon to revolve. Let me back up. He created the earth to spin on its axis with regard to the sun to give us day and night. And then he made the earth to revolve around the sun to give us calendar days and years so that we could mark time. Because time was going to be important. Um, and then separated the waters from the sky from the water 
on the earth, gave us the sky, put, um, told the ocean how far it could go, filled the ocean with sea creatures, put birds in the air, created all of the animals and things and put them on the earth. And everything that he did in all of those days of creation, he spoke it into existence, right? He just spoke it and it happened. And I can't even take a whole mix of ingredients and make something fancy. And he did all of this from nothing because everything was formless and void in the beginning when there was just God. And so he made all of this stuff. But then when it came to the pinnacle of his creation, which was man, do you all remember what was different about that? He took the dust of the ground and he formed it and he put his, his breath into it. So already he was making man to be different from the, from the rest of creation. And he put man over creation. He gave him dominion. And then he looked at man and he thought he was great, but he was like, mm, buddy, you're going to need some help. So... <laughs> He put him into a deep sleep, and he took a rib, and he made Eve. And he put Adam and Eve in the garden with power and dominion over everything he had created. And he gave all of it to them as a gift, except that one thing, that one tree that he did not want them to eat from. And along came the sneaky snake, and he did what Satan likes to do. He likes to take our attention and our focus off of all the many things God has blessed us with and get us honed in on the one thing that God told us to stay away from. And so Adam, I mean, Eve took the fruit and she took a bite. And with that one bite, all of eternity was changed forever because with that bite came sin and sickness and death and all of creation changed. Um, they couldn't stay in the garden after that. A man was going to have to work and toil with, um, briars and, you know, things that he would not have had to deal with before. Women were going to have pain in childbirth. So we can thank Eve for a lot of the stuff that we go through. Um, so um, from there, we have a lot of our Old Testament stories that aren't pictured, but like, you know, um, Cain and Abel, Noah's Ark, all that. And then we get to Abraham and there's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob becomes, later is named Israel. And he has a bunch of sons. The 12 sons later become the 12 tribes of Israel. One of his sons was Joseph, who was the favorite. Because Joseph was the favorite, the other brothers got jealous and didn't like him. Sold him into slavery to Egypt, which was okay because God made good of it, right? God moved Joseph up in the ranks and he became second in command in Egypt, which put him in place to save the children of Israel when the big famine was coming later. So um, Israel and all of them moved to Egypt. They become really prosperous and multiply like crazy. And so then Pharaoh gets nervous about it and uh, is afraid they're going to try to take over and, um, I guess, like turn against the Egyptians. So then he puts them in slavery. That's where we get Moses coming on the scene. He comes along and he delivers them from Egyptian bondage, leads them through the Red Sea to the Promised Land. But if y'all remember, the children of Israel were real grippy and whiny and they complained and they were rebellious and disobedient. And so God was like, I know I promised it to you, but I'm not going to fulfill that yet because y'all are brats. So they have to wait. They're not allowed to go in, and um, at time goes on, and then um, they're really frustrating. It's kind of how I feel with my kids sometimes um, with when they get whiny and grappy and disobedient. And so uh, God tells Moses, speak to this rock, and Moses, in his frustration, hits the rock. I don't know if you, have ever, as a parent, have ever felt frustrated enough to, like, whack something. So he hits the rock. And in that little moment of disobedience, God doesn't allow him into the promised land either, which is so heartbreaking for me that he's had to put up with these, you know, grappy kids for 40 years or so, and then he's not allowed in because he hit a rock instead of speaking to it. So um, Moses passes away, and Joshua takes on the torch, and he leads them into the promised land, and God helps them conquer the land that ends up being theirs, the promise, what was promised to them. So they do pretty good while Joshua's living, but then um, when he dies, they, 
they make a promise to him before he dies that they're going to serve God, but they don't keep their promise. And so they end up rebellious and disobedient again. And so God allows them to be defeated by other, other peoples. And so when that happens, they cry out to God. And, of course, he hears their cry like he always does, and he sends judges. So that's where we are on the thing up there. We've gone through Moses, Joshua. We're at the judges now. So what happened with that is um, there was a period of judges, and the people would be pretty good while they had a judge living to lead them. But once that guy died off, then they would turn back to their sinful ways. Over and over and over, the cycle of disobedience, crying out to God, he would rescue them, they would be okay for a minute, then they would go back to it again. Um, so they kept repeatedly turning to the surrounding people groups and um, other countries and kind of envying or idolizing the things that they had, even their kings. So they got to the point where they asked God if they could have a king of their own. And it wasn't what he ever intended. He wanted them to see him as their king. And so um, he, you know, tried to tell them, this is not good for you. But y'all know in our own lives that sometimes God lets us have what we think we want. But it comes with the consequences down the road. So that's what happens. He gives them a king. He first anoints Saul. And Saul is good for a little bit. And then he turns psychotic. Um, and God removes his favor from Saul, and he anoints David. David becomes king. And um, even though David broke the heart of God with his sin, he was repentant, genuinely repentant. And that is a huge difference all through the Old Testament. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But we can sin and break God's heart but if we come before him with something more than just a little ritualistic sacrifice, like we're going to talk about more in a little bit from the Old Testament, that is, I mean, he is willing and there and able to forgive and restore and carry out the purpose that we were intended for when he created us. So from David, we, our next king is Solomon. And if y'all know much about Solomon, he was the son of Bathsheba which was the one that David sinned with. Now, it's not, he's not the son that they produced in that moment of sin, but to me, it just speaks of God's grace that it was one of her sons that was used in the lineage of Christ. So Solomon's our next king, and then after him is just this line of a bunch of kings. Most of them are evil and disobedient. And during this time, God is sending prophets out to his people, just trying over and over to woo them back, to tell them, you are breaking my heart, you are, you're basically like an adulterous wife, is what he called them. Um, you're, you're unfaithful to me, you're leaving me, you're breaking my heart. Um, and so, if, if any of you, like me, have ever lived through infidelity, you know that there's a, a while that your heart is broken, but then there's a while that you're just mad, too. And so God got angry, and he would get really just repeatedly rebellious and disobedient and unfaithful. And he would discipline them. But he warned them over and over through the prophets that he was going to do that. And so um, sometimes they would come back for a little while, but then they would turn away again. And so there's just this cycle over and over in the Old Testament of disobedience, God calling them back, them you know, maybe coming back for a little bit, but over and over their heart just wasn't in it. And that's where we find ourselves in today's text. We're in Ezekiel. He was one of the prophets. Um, and a lot of times when God would discipline his people, he would do it by allowing them to be defeated or taken captive by foreign countries. And so that's what's happened here. Babylon has um, taken a bunch of the um, Jews captive, and um, Ezekiel is among them. So we're going to pick up now in Ezekiel. Um, it's a 48-chapter book. He's one of the major prophets, not major because he was a big deal, but major because it's one of the longer books of prophecy. The first um, 39 or so chapters is God speaking judgment on them and on the surrounding countries and then the last several chapters are him uh, making his promise that he's going to 
bring them back together. He's going to restore them. He's going to set up a lasting covenant. And then he speaks to the millennial king, which we know is Jesus, um, who fulfills all the prophecy of the Old Testament. So we're about five years into their time in um, Babylon whenever God starts using Ezekiel. And then he prophesies for about 22 years total. Um, And so we're coming into chapter 37 here with all of that in mind. Y'all with me? Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to read from my paper because I don't have, my eyes are 41 years old and I can't see those words. So um, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Now, I'm going to stop there a minute. Y'all ever been in a place like this where God's got you somewhere and he wants you to see what he's capable of? He wants you to come out and say, I got the faith, Lord, I see it, but you can't really muster it. You're just like, I'm in God only, you know. (laughs) I've definitely been there before. Like, I want to see what you want to do, but, I mean, I can't see it. And it's really kind of creepy what you're suggesting. So, um, <laughs> Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded which I know he had to feel kind of weird doing that. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. Okay, so for a second, let's hone in on this little phrase in verse 11 where the people of Israel feel like our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off. So the very first point that we can draw from this is disobedience distances us from God. Okay, now the first example of this is back in the garden where we were talking a minute ago about when Eve bit into that fruit and sin entered the world. Okay, so if, if we go back and we were to read all of that chapter, we would see that after they did that, they recognized their nakedness and they sewed fig leaves and put them on And then when God came walking through the garden in the cool of the day, like he usually did, they hid from him. So they have distanced themselves from God because of their disobedience and their shame, right? So that's kind of the first we see of sin separating us from God. So when God comes and he says, where are you? Why are you hiding? And then they play their blame game where Adam blames Eve and Eve blames the devil And then God tells them what's going to be the consequence of all this and tells her and the serpent that eventually her seed is going to defeat you. So we know right there from like Genesis chapter 2 or 3, whichever one it is, that God has already told Satan, your days are numbered. My son's going to come around and he's going to destroy you. Um, and then God takes animal skins and he covers their nakedness. So we see God established there in early Genesis the sacrificial system. That was the very first sacrifice of an animal symbolically covering the sin of mankind. So that's 
the system they live under in the Old Testament, this sacrificial system, that ended up being really faulty because what the people did was they would just live how they wanted to live, knowing that they could perform this ritual that would supposedly make them right with God. And then it didn't make them right with God. God was very upset about it. God repeatedly said, I want obedience over sacrifice. But they weren't hearing that. Their hearts were so hard that they couldn't give up their sin and their idolatry. They just repeatedly sought after that. They thought that they were okay with God when truly they were breaking his heart. And God knew, we know, and he knew from early Genesis, but I think he saw throughout the Old Testament played out that it was going to require something. It was going to require his son to ultimately, ultimately be the sacrifice for our sins. Um, now, if we read a chapter previous to where our text is today, Ezekiel 36, verse 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And so, all throughout the Old Testament, through the prophets, God alludes to a Savior that's going to come. And we know that through Jesus, the heart of mankind would be changed. He would be the thing that would come that would break our hardened hearts, the hearts that were hardened with sin. Now, the next part of this verse, though, speaks to how that's going to happen. It talks about the Holy Spirit. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I give your ancestors and you will be my people and I will be your God. So um, disobedience has distanced, us, distanced them from God, distances us from God. Uh, the sacrificial system was faulty. People got caught up in ritual over repentance. I think we see that even today where people think church attendance or doing good things can make them right with God while they carry on with ugly, sinful hearts. And God is saying, none of that is what's going to make you right with me. So he sends us his son, Jesus, to be the final atoning sacrifice to cover for our sins. And then when we accept Christ ooh, as our Savior, then that holy, that promised Holy Spirit comes to live in us and change our heart so that then we can feel when we sin against God. Y'all know that conviction feeling when you feel terrible when you've done something? That's the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Um, but the people back then, they were just so hard-hearted and stubborn, they didn't want to hear that. Um, and so they just stayed in their sin, and they were so separated from God that they felt like they were dried up and cut off. Psalm 40, verse 2, this is David, and he says, He lifted me up from the pit of despair out of the miry clay. And I don't know if y'all have ever been in a place in your life where you felt that amount of despair and that amount of hopelessness. Where, like King David, you felt like God was what was going to have to bring you up out of that pit. And so that's our next point here. God can resurrect us from the valley. God can bring us out of the pit. God can resurrect us. If we think about the, the examples of resurrection in the Bible, okay? So we've got Lazarus and Jesus in the New Testament. Lazarus was dead for four days, and Jesus called him back to life. Jesus had been crucified and was in the grave and resurrected on the third day. So that's pretty incredible. But I'm going to read you these verses again from our Ezekiel passage. Because this blows my mind as a physical therapist, what happened here. So, I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. So, okay. So, with Lazarus and Jesus, you have intact bodies still, with flesh and organs and stuff. And they're called back to life. But in this valley of dry bones, which some of the um, commentaries that I read thought that it might have been a battleground at some point. So you've got not just one dead body there that's 
that's decayed and dried up, but like heaps of them. So you've got heaps of dried bones, probably scattered and mixed up, and then just at God's command, these bones come together. And they don't just form skeletons, because that would be creepy enough, but they sprout muscles and connective tissue and skin. So now you've got this creepy collection of corpses standing there, okay? Can y'all imagine Ezekiel seeing this vision? That's really trippy. Like, I'll be like, is this from God or did I eat something really bad? <laughs> so, so this is what he's seeing. And this is incredible because it, we've gone from dried, decayed bones to now a creepy collection of corpses here in front of you. Um, which is incredible in itself. But the thing that's lacking is life, right? They're there, but they're not doing anything. So they had it together on the outside, but they were dead on their feet. And I think that's kind of how we get sometimes in life, where, like, I may look like I've got it going on because I'm managing and I'm juggling three boys' sports schedules while dragging a two-year-old around and potty training. And y'all may think that I am managing all this, but on the inside, oh my gosh, like I'm exhausted and I'm dead on my feet and I'm probably anxious. And, you know, sometimes I just feel dried up, right? I feel spiritually dehydrated. I'm thirsty. I need something. I need life. I'm living, but am I living? And so that's where God comes along in these next verses. God's spirit breathes life into dry souls. The next verses say, I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Son of man, say to it, this is, the so this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. Okay, so if we go back to Genesis 2, I keep taking us back there because this is not the first time God's breathed his life into humanity. In creation, he, he spoke everything into existence until he created man and then what? He breathed his life into it. He made humanity different from all other creations by putting himself in us. And then whenever we separated ourselves through sin... And he sent Jesus to be that bridge that connected us back to him. He gave us again the gift of the Holy Spirit to put his spirit and breath back in us. And that separates Christianity from other religions. So in the beginning, he separated humanity from other creatures. And then in salvation, he separates his people from all the other people. He puts his spirit within us. And what we see in these verses is that they were there on their feet looking like they had it together, but there was no life in them until the breath of God entered them. And then it says, they came, let's see. Come breath, breathe into these slain that they may live. I'm looking for, let me turn my Bible in. This is the verse. I thought I put it in here. But this is what, what I want you to hear. The breath came into them and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Okay, so y'all hear me say, God's breath came into them and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So not only did his spirit give them purpose in their life, but in his army. So you do see what I'm saying? His spirit empowers you not just to live the life that he's created you to live, but to serve out the purpose that he has for you and all of creation to be part of his army. The next point is God's spirit enables us for life more abundant. When he puts that spirit in us, 
He's gifting us with something incredible. Back in John 16, Jesus, this is before the crucifixion, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. And they couldn't understand how it could possibly be possible that anything would be better than having Jesus with them. But on this side of the crucifixion and the resurrection and his ascension into heaven, whenever he left and the Spirit came down and it filled his people and it fills our hearts whenever we accept him as our Savior, we can see how having the Spirit is to our advantage. We're going to go through a list of things that the Spirit empowers us to do, but before I get to that, I want to tell you the main thing that it does. What we didn't talk about a whole lot from Old Testament history is that When they brought their sacrifices to atone for their sin, they took it to the priest. And the priest was the one who took it into the Holy of Holies to God. They had him to be their bridge between their sin and God. When Jesus died, do y'all remember the part about how the veil was torn from the top down? That's because we no longer needed a priest to go through that veil with our sacrifice. Jesus is our priest. He is now going between us and God with his own blood, his sacrifice, covering our sin. We have direct access now. We don't need some intermediate fella. We have direct access through the Holy Spirit. Um, So if we go back to that John 16 7 and 8, after the part I read, says, But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he being the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So apart from the Spirit, there's no conviction. So that's his first work of the Holy Spirit. He convicts us. The next one, we're going to just go through these pretty quick. He fills us with God's love. Romans 5, 5. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. He teaches us. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That one's huge to me because, um, like Scripture, okay? So if we try to read and learn the Word of God, sometimes that seems really hard without help from the Spirit. He helps us understand what God's Word is saying, and He puts it in our mind, even if, gosh, y'all, my memory's so bad with all these kids that I have. But sometimes it's like out of nowhere, a verse will just come at the right moment in the right situation. And that's because the Holy Spirit in me brings it up at the right time so that it can be useful. Um, The next one is the Holy Spirit provides wisdom and discernment. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. The Spirit searches all things, even in the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Y'all, discernment is so huge. In this world we live in right now, things are so tainted by sin. Sometimes they can appear to be good on the outside, but they are ugly, ugly underneath. And that spirit, if y'all have ever been in a situation where something just didn't feel right and it didn't sit right or you had that gut feeling that something wasn't right, you listen to that because usually that is the spirit of God telling you it may be pretty, but what's underneath is not of me. And you need to listen to that because that spirit is going to guide you to the things that are of him and try to take you away from those things that aren't of him that are going to be harmful, not only to your spirit, but to his name because you're going to be his representative. And if you get caught up in some mess that's going to pull you away from him, he's, he's trying with his discernment to keep you away from that. Romans 8.26 is the next verse. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. And um, that's just exactly what the verse says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Intercedes for us. Romans eight twenty seven. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So sometimes we do not know what the will of God is. We, we don't know how to pray. Or sometimes our heart is just so broken and shattered that we couldn't get words out of our mouth if we wanted to. I have been there. I have lived those days where I just cried because 
I trusted that the Holy Spirit was interceding for me at that point because I couldn't put a prayer together if I wanted to. That's how broken I was. And the Holy Spirit takes our heart's cry and he puts it in the ear of God and then he takes God's answer and he puts it in our heart. And that is how the Spirit intercedes for us. And now this last one, which is, is in so important, and it's why we camped out in this chapter today. The Holy Spirit empowers us for his purpose. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just come in here to help us in daily life. It helps us to spread the gospel, to be his ambassadors in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. It empowers us for what he ultimately created us for, which was to be his image to a world that so desperately needs to see the face of God. Um, so we wonder if we have this power available to us through the Holy Spirit from the moment that we believe in Christ and we're indwelled with the Holy Spirit. If that power is in us, why do we walk around so often feeling discouraged and downtrodden and dead on our feet? Um, Psalm 63, 1 says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there's no water. John 7, 37 through 39, Jesus stands um, at the end of a festival and he says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them by this he meant the Spirit. So sometimes we feel spiritually thirsty and dehydrated when we have that living water already in us. So what can we do about that? If we already have that available to us, what can we do to keep from feeling so spiritually dry? I think the answer, even though it's out of context with how it's said in Ezekiel, is we need to speak to the breath. We need to speak to that Holy Spirit that lives within us already. And we need to say, God, Holy Spirit, help me. Guide me. Empower me. Use me for your purpose. We are missing out on something that we have already been given. We have all this power available within us and we're just not accessing we're not speaking to it we're not using it we're going to move into a time of invitation and if those who know me know I went through about three years ago was the worst days of my life and there were days y'all where um, I would come up here during the week I would drop Addie off at daycare and I would come in here and lay myself across that altar because I felt so powerless my marriage was falling apart and every dream I had for the future was just gone I never felt eternally hopeless I never felt like life was hopeless but there was no more hope for my marriage or my dreams I needed God so desperately and I said spirit help me and he did it took time but I can very clearly remember, I love working in the yard. And we had this beautiful yard. And I was out there in the yard. And I finally saw how much I had neglected the yard while I was barely living. And it was like my soul was coming back to life. And that spirit in me had been there all along. But the things of this world and what Satan tried to do had just bound me up. I was not living in the power that he had given me. 
And you may feel like that today. And we're going to have an open invitation time. And I'm going to invite you. If you've allowed disobedience to distance you from God. He is there. Just like he did for those bratty Israelites. He was always there. Ready to bring them back in. And to love them. And to say once again. I am your God and you are my people. If you need to pull your life up out of the pit. He is able. He alone is able. He has all the power. He is able. If you need him to breathe fresh life into your soul, cry out to him. If you need the spirit to empower you for that life more abundant, speak to the breath. Speak to the spirit of God and say, fill me, help me. Use me, guide me, empower me for the life you've given me. And the life you want me to live. The altar is going to be open. Our ladies are going to close us. Here in a song. There's going to be workers down front. um, If you need somebody to pray with you. And y'all please do not let. Any kind of embarrassment. Or whatever thing. Is coming into your mind right now. That may be Satan trying to keep you. From coming forward and getting your your life back with God. He doesn't want us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Think of how much he would be defeated if every one of us lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Y'all go ahead. and stand if you don't feel like coming forth to pray that's okay but I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about the words of this song 
His holy presence living inside of you is your daily bread, is the air that you breathe. It's your life sustenance. And you praise Him for that. again so much for being with us today um gosh I just feel like it was great from a free breakfast that I didn't cook um (laughs) beautiful worship music and then the word of God I'm just so thankful that his spirit fills us and empowers us and I pray that as you leave here you'll go out in that um if you're a mother happy mother's day weekend if you're not a mother you're probably at least kind of feeling that role in somebody's life. I had a a lady in college who um, had never been married, never had any kids, but she was a mother figure to me during my college years when I was nowhere near, you know, any mom back home. So sometimes you don't have to have birthed a child to be a mama in somebody's eyes. And thank God the world has so many mamas. God, I think God gave us probably a heart most similar to his. I'm going to stick with that anyway. Um, <laughs> um, did you want to say anything? You want me to close this in prayer? Y'all give Benita a hand. <laughs> You're welcome. I love you. Love you. you ready? Okay. God, we're just so thankful for who you are. Um, we're thankful that you knew from early in that garden that we were going to need Jesus to come and be our Savior, God, that he was going to be the final atoning sacrifice that would cover for our sins, and that when he did that, he would be our priest, he would bring us back to you, he would bridge that gap, and that your Holy Spirit would fill us so that we could live life more abundant. And God, I pray that we grab on to that. I pray that we would be... um, led today to to call out to you, to live in the spirit and in the power that you've given us, God, that we wouldn't go through life feeling downcast or downtrodden, dead on our feet, spiritually dry and thirsty, God, but we would realize that you, the living water, are alive inside of us and that your spirit is what does that for us, God. I pray that you would bless everyone. I pray that you would use us for your glory. And I pray that we would make you famous in this world. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming.